Hello and welcome to the Weather Studio Live. We are broadcasting live from the heart of the Met Office. It's Tuesday, it's one o'clock. I'm Alex Deakin. And I'm Ada McGiven. Coming up this week, it's turned cold. You'll have noticed. If you stepped out this morning, you'll have felt that bitter wind from the east. Will it bring any snow? We'll be looking at the forecast in detail over the next few days. And how long will it stay cold for? Big uncertainties into next week. We'll be discussing the cause of those uncertainties and what we know about the forecast and what we don't know about the forecast through the next 10 days or so. And we'll also be talking about some humongous waves <laughs> that affected the Canary Islands. Humongous waves and where are the biggest seas around the world. Uh, but please do get in touch. We are live on YouTube. We are live on Twitter. We don't think we're live on Facebook. Hashtag Facebook down is trending on Twitter. There's a reason for that. It's not our fault, but we're not live on Facebook this week. We can still send us your questions if you're watching this on YouTube or on Twitter. Please do get involved. We'll try and answer some of those questions as we go through the show. And don't forget to give us the thumbs up and, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you will never miss an episode of the weather studio and why would you want to miss one when they're so jam-packed with information like this week's and we are starting with uh, waves you may have seen this picture on social media through this week uh, pretty impressive this was in Tenerife just check out the balconies there all fine it's a bit choppy and then watch what happens a huge storm uh, out in the Atlantic creating these massive waves unusual waves. you can ominous. see the wave coming in it does look ominous, ominous. Bang, just wipes out that balcony. Unusual to get such big waves in this part of the world. And the Spanish um, meteorological organization named the storm associated with this Carlos. The storm itself was way out in the Atlantic, but it was huge swell, and you can see why dangerous waves here. But not a part of the world that often gets big waves. We thought we'd take a tour around the world just to look at some of the uh, most lively seas around the globe. And we'll start almost exactly opposite the Canaries and the uh, Southern Hemisphere. Can you spin it round, Aidan? One, uh, one of the most notorious seas uh, or shipping channels, if you like, is the Cook Strait between North and South New Zealand. Now, one of the reasons why it gets such big waves is partly to do with the geography. As you can see there, there's a, a narrow strip of land between the two um, mm -hmm. islands of New Zealand, but also because it's within the Roaring Forties, really, it's a lot of weather systems piling through, so it's a very active place. It gets weather systems like the UK does, because it's in a similar, uh, but in the Southern Hemisphere, so it gets a lot of low pressure. The waves funnel through the sea tries to funnel through that gap, and it creates some very stormy seas. Roaring Forties. You're in your Roaring Forties, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Barely. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, uh, where are we going now? Speaking of Roaring Thought, we're staying in the Roaring Forties, aren't uh -huh, we? Uh-huh. And uh, the stormiest sea in the world. Whoa! Spin it right round. Spin it right round. That's the Drake Passage, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so this is South America. There's Antarctica. And again, uh, uh, the, 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 w the water just flows through here between the two oceans, effectively. So you get a little bit of front of me. That's quite a big gap. But again, it's mostly to do with the winds in this part of the world. Uh, the Roaring Forties, again, because it's 40 degrees south, it's quite a well-known uh, weather phenomenon. If we look at the bigger picture, actually, from... Whoa, why is it doing that? That's amazing. You can see right around Antarctica there, a lot of isobars in the chart on that ring. It just gets a lot of very stormy weather. You don't just get the Roaring Forties, do you? You also get the uh, Furious 50s, the Screaming 60s. <laughs> these keep these going, are keep genuine. Going. Uh, uh, you, by the time you get to 70s, it's you're probably scum, in an Antarctica yeah, yeah, that's true, that's facing true, a whole, that's true. whole different uh, set of Let's go to the other pole uh, and close by, well, close by at least to the North Pole. If we go over to uh, Greenland, which is another one of the, the liveliest seas around the globe, a little bit closer to home, is between here and here. So the uh, Herminger Sea uh, is uh, between Greenland and Iceland. And in here, again, you get a lot of low pressure systems. And again, you just get a lot of active weather. And again, it tends to funnel up through those two land masses. And land is crucial to creating big waves. And that's what we see also in the Bay of Biscay. Again, a lot closer closer to home here. You get a lot of Atlantic weather systems piling in here, not at the moment because we've got a blocked weather pattern, but and that shallowing sea there just creates the waves that just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's a, many a shipwreck in the Bay of Biscay, of course. Mm. Uh, so yeah, some of, the, some of the most dramatic seas from around the world. Yeah, try and avoid them if you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, let's take a look now at what the weather's doing at the moment, because as I mentioned, it's not that dramatic that we're 
bit stuck in a weather pattern at the moment. We've got low pressure generally down to the southwest, big blocking area of high pressure. We call it a blocking area of high because it basically stops the low pressure systems coming in. Why is it set up like this? Well, if we put the jet stream on, then we can really see what's going on at the moment. So out here across the Atlantic, powerful jet stream, looks fairly normal at this stage, creating a, a cold spell across the northeast of the UK. But here, it's splitting. It's uh, bifurcating is the technical term. You get an arm of it going up around there and down there. So we've got high pressure in across the UK. But also, there's an arm of the jet stream diving down to the south towards the Canaries, helping to create the unsettled weather here, and more particularly across uh, mainland Spain at the moment, where there's further thunderstorms coming in currently. So that's the big picture. That's why our weather patterns are blocked, which is why we've got an easterly wind at the moment. It looks familiar, doesn't it? We had a similar pattern mm. in June with very different consequences, <laughs> of course. We had high pressure, yeah. a very, very warm month. And, of course, at the moment, what we're seeing is easterly winds, very cold feel, stepping outside. Now, let's take a look at the UK forecast in a bit more detail. I'll put on the cloud and rain there. So this is for the rest of... Um, there we go. Let's put on the winds. This is for the rest of Tuesday and into Wednesday. And you can see that easterly wind bringing very cold air with it. And as a result, we're seeing some wintry weather. Now, first thing, on um, Wednesday, it's most likely that we'll see rain at lower levels and the cloud and rainfall is most likely to be affecting uh, eastern parts of Scotland, eastern parts of uh, England as well. The Pennines seeing miserable weather over the next 24 hours very wet conditions here, but also some snow over the hills of the Pennines, tending to be above 400 metres. Hills of the uh, central and eastern part of Scotland, the Grampians, 400 metres or so. Now, you'll notice a slight shift in the wind direction for southern parts of England. So this is the first thing on Wednesday. And what we'd like to see is some very lively showers come into southern counties of England, as well as South Wales. Hail, thunder, that sort of thing. But don't be surprised through Tuesday night if you see some flakes of snow over the South Downs, the North Downs. We've actually got colder air in place across southern Britain compared to northern Britain. And so we could even have some slushy snow of lying over some vegetated surfaces over the North Downs and South wow, Downs. So almost a winter wonderland, not, not quite, quite though. Not quite. Not this quite. is no beast from the east. You've probably noticed a dramatic drop in the temperature. If you've been outside, yes, it is cold, particularly in the east, it's bleak, you would say, but it's not as cold. The air is nothing like as cold as when we had the proper beast from the east, which is why we're not getting uh, any snowfall, really, of which to talk about, except over the hills. But it does feel a lot colder because, of course, last week was so mild. So it is a big shock to the system. But this is not unusual for November. It's not even that cold air, really, for November. We've had colder spells in mm. November's before. So it's not that exceptional. But it does feel a lot colder than it has done, that is for sure. Very, if you've got very that pouring rain field. in the east, yeah, the rest it is, of it is pretty bleak. The winds now on, on Wednesday afternoon, there'll be more sunshine through sort of central parts of England into the southeast, so an improvement there. But for a lot of places over the next few days, it's just going to be grey and grim. It's going to feel cold. The winds will ease a little bit. Temperatures after a very frosty start on Thursday. Thursday is going to be potentially the frostiest, coldest start to the uh, day of the whole week. So, you know, sheltered parts of Wales, Western England could see temperatures dipping to minus five or so. Uh, but gradually those temperatures will become a little bit higher through the next few days. Not a great deal. They'll still but stay below average throughout the... Interesting afternoon. at the moment, the temperatures by day and night are not changing too much because tonight there'll be a lot of cloud and there'll be a fairly strong wind so the, the earth doesn't cool down as much. So actually the nights at the moment, not as cold. There's just little variation, temperatures staying about five or six by day and by night. It's when the winds fall a little lighter, particularly on Wednesday night, that the nights will get a bit colder. That's when we'll have a frost. So, mm. sort of bizarrely, the coldest air is across us today. It feels cold out there by day, but actually the coldest night will probably be later in the week when we get the clearer skies. Now, a lot of people like cold weather at this time of year, <laughs> but what they <laughs> often do. imagine as cold weather are uh, those crisp, yes. sunny autumn days, those or frosty mornings. snow. Or somewhere. snow. And we're in a messy bit in the middle either. that don't get either. <laughs> I don't think many people will like cold rain 
and grey skies. No. And temperatures are a little below average. And that's kind of what we're stuck with even this is this is Friday morning, even as we head towards the end of the week. Now one difference by Friday is that we'll start to see more of an influence of this low pressure. You can see some weather fronts moving up. Now this contains less cold air, and that means that temperatures may well get into the double figures for southwest England. And we'll also have some heavy downpours, so some perhaps thunder and hail showers across uh, Devon, Cornwall, perhaps into South Wales as we end the working week. Um, but the rest of the country keeps this easterly. It's not quite as uh, uh, tightly packed on those isobars as we'll see over the next few days, so not quite as windy. But really it's just a static situation as we head into the weekend. Little change in easterly airflow, a few showers, but not a great deal, a lot of dry weather through the weekend. And with slightly less of a wind, we'll probably see a bit more frost, a bit more fog overnight, particularly across western parts of the UK. So we keep the cold air. Temperatures will stay below average right up until the end of the weekend and the start of next week. Just not quite as cold as they'll be over the next couple of days. And if any questions come in? Yeah, we've got quite a few questions up. coming in, uh, mostly about when's it going to snow. Well, we've got a little bit today, but really only over the tops of the hill. Central Scotland the next few days. It'll get a bit brighter in Central Scotland, actually. Tomorrow morning looks a bit grim, a bit wet, but actually from tomorrow afternoon it should get a little bit brighter. But again, depending on which side of Central Scotland you're on, the Edinburgh side where the wind's coming in from the east, it'll feel colder than on the Glasgow side where you get a little bit more in the way of shelter. Uh, YouTube, Chris O'Shea. I predicted this week's chill and beyond with heavy snow in the south may stay until uh, mainly in January. Well, it's a bold statement there from Chris O'Shea. Mm. Thanks for that, Chris. We'll have to check, check back <laughs> with Chris check your at, forecast. The January. at the moment, the, the forecast for the winter is really split into there's no really strong signals at the moment, not as strong as the signals were a couple of months ago. So there's still all to play for with the winter forecast um, over the next few weeks we will see more but definitely the moment as we've seen there a little bit of snow on the hills with this cold smell but nothing uh, more unusual than that. Beyond that though, it gets quite exciting. Mm. And next week, there's a lot of uncertainty. There is. And, well, we're looking at two potential outcomes that are very different to each other. Let's bring in this week's special guest. Yes, you may have yes. seen Helen Roberts Come before. On in, She's Helen. back Come on for in, another Helen. go. Hello. She enjoyed it so much. Um, Helen, quickly, just to tell everyone at home what your role is here at the Met Office and, and what you do day to day. Sure. So I'm Helen Roberts. I'm a senior operational meteorologist in the media team in the operations centre here in Exeter. So in the media team, we're looking after all of our broadcast customers. We're providing telephone briefings a number of times throughout the day to make sure that the forecast and the story is consistent amongst all of our, our broadcast teams and presenters and that the key weather story is, is getting across. We're providing graphics and sometimes scripts as well. And it's fair to say there's been a bit of media interest in the weather over the recent couple of weeks. Are they people uh, absolutely to get has. a bit interested when it gets a bit cold? As and, soon um, as the S words mentions, <laughs> then yeah, it all goes nuts. Bones starts <laughs> to ring. And that's kind of one of the elements that we're looking at as we go into next week, aren't we? The, the uncertainty yeah. about next week. That's what you're here to discuss. Uh, what is this chart showing? Well, this chart is showing, you know, there's a big low pressure out to, to the west here. Um, and there's a high pressure to the east and it's a bit of a battleground and it's often the case at this time of year that one or the other tends to win out. So this is what we call a, a deterministic solution. This is giving us one answer, if you like, to one the forecast snapshot. question. This is for next Tuesday this and is it's the next just week. One, one of the main computer models, that's what, they, that's what it thinks. But that's yeah. not necessarily how we do longer range forecasts, is it? Because that's not necessarily that useful? Yeah, so it's quite useful for, say, the next couple of days or so, but once you get into the longer range period, then it's useful to use what we call ensemble forecasting. So this is when we run our computer models a number of times, multiple times, with very, very slightly different starting conditions. So we just nudge the starting conditions in a very, very tiny way, and that can give us very different outcomes, so we, particularly the further ahead you go. Yes, yeah, so at the start of the forecast you make tiny little adjustments that yeah. then have a no, huge knock-on effect a week later, because this is what we're looking at now, so th what, what's this chart? Yeah, so is this, I mean there's an awful lot of information here, but this is what we call our postage stamps, and this is where we have run the model 50 times, so there are 50 different solutions here, and they are, as you would expect, all sharing slightly different things. Um, sometimes they'll all be very, very similar, in which case 
we've got a good deal of certainty in the forecast, good amount of predictability. Um, but when they're all saying different things, that's when there's a lot of uncertainty. Interestingly, I looked up the word uncertainty um, because it's a word that we use quite a lot in, is, yeah, in forecasting. Yeah. Um, and generally, there's a lot of negativity associated <laughs> yes, with it. Yes, there is. So here we've got the state of being uncertain and some, some alternative words um, a doubt and misgivings and apprehension. They're all quite negative yeah, words, yeah, yeah. but it's not a negative term to use in, in science and in particular in meteorology. Exactly. There's always uncertainty in the forecast. It's just how much, and, and that's what we're looking at here. We're not ensembles. unique, are we? I mean, you see some very bold predictions in the press often that don't come from the Met Office, and the truth is that no one can say for sure what's happening once you get beyond a few days. So inevitably you have to talk about uncertainty, the relative likelihoods of different scenarios. And yeah, probabilities of different, different solutions. So that next. was 50 different solutions. All of the same, actually the same. So the UK, you probably couldn't see it on there because it was really quite small. Because the UK map knew the pressure fields for next week exactly, at the same time yeah. for next Tuesday. Yeah. What have we done here? We've simplified it a little we've bit. We've simplified it and we've actually got as it turns out, two main groups, almost a 50-50 split between the two, but they're giving us very different answers. So one group is showing us um, high pressure, tending to dominate, uh, easterly winds, and therefore cold, but quite settled. The other solution, almost the opposite. So we've got very mild air, a southerly feed of air, and low pressure close by, either giving us very stormy conditions or at least giving us that, that mild air. So it's either cold or mild, effectively. Uh, uh, if, you, if you squint and you step back, they both <laughs> look quite similar, don't they? But you know, subtle differences, really, aren't they? We, we, they've both got low they've pressure They've both got lows and, and high pressure somewhere in the vicinity mm. of Scandinavia. But it's which one wins out, which one nudges a little closer, bit closer yeah. to the we'll UK. We'll try and post these charts on as a link through, through our YouTube so you can see them a little bit cl more closely. But basically a difference of what, where the low pressure is has a massive influence on the UK. And it's, it's a low pressure and it could be, what, just a couple of hundred miles. Yeah. And a week away, a position of a low pressure within a couple of hundred, that's perfectly normal to have that uncertainty. Yeah. But it's just really important at the moment because it's going to mean very different weather as to which, which side it goes, isn't it? Whether we the get pressure pattern is, is all about our wind direction. And as we know, we're an island nation. The wind direction is crucial, crucial. to the weather that we get, and particularly the temperatures. And particularly, even more especially at this time of year yeah. and, and December, um, it, we tend to get one or other particularly mild or particularly cold. Here's a summary of that. Um, so if we're talking roughly 50-50, on the top there we've got one scenario, 50% roughly likely, high pressure to the north of the UK, easterly winds, similar to what we've got at the moment, yeah. so cold, chance of some wintry precipitation, but a lot of dry weather as well because it's high pressure. And then on the bottom here we've got the other likely scenario yeah. and it's got low pressure closer to the UK, high pressure further east than the UK and very mild air. Yeah, we've got a warm southerly feed of air here with the, with the low pressure out to the west. Um, in this solution we've also got mild mm. air but the low pressure is closer to the UK and this is our stormy solution. Stormy, so yeah, 50-50, high pressure, cold or low pressure, mild, potentially stormy, potentially wet and windy. Yeah. But when you've got a split like that, 50-50, well, you really cannot say, can you? But it, it, it's two extremes, isn't it? Rather than, you, you can't really average them and say, well, we'll go somewhere in the middle. No, you're because either going to get one or the other. Ultimately, if you did average it, then you're almost certain to get the forecast wrong because that, that isn't what we're expecting to happen. It will be one or other of those more extreme solutions. This shows it quite nicely. This is what we call a, a plume chart. So you can see that the, the lines um, and the plume are fairly narrow, are fairly mm. close together at the beginning of the forecast. That's what you would expect. time going on at the bottom. So this is today. Yep, so this is today, going right uh, way through to the end of next week. Well, it's the temperature at 5,000 feet. So it just gives an idea of the kind of weather that we're likely to experience down here at the surface. But you can see the further ahead in time we go, the more uncertainty it is, there is in the forecast, the, the, the more the spread of the possible solutions. We've got two lines here. This dashed line is our what we call our deterministic solution. That's what I mentioned earlier. That's running the model once. That gives you an answer. This 
uh, solid line is our control. Uh, this is a lower resolution, so this is a, a higher resolution deterministic, lower resolution control model from which all of the ensemble members it, feed. Fainter pink. You might be able to paint the paint, fainter pink lines are all of the different different all solutions. of the different fifty solutions showing a wide spread. But even those two different ones show that spread quite very nicely. very different. Yeah. So it's likely to be colder into the early part of next week. Most likely to stay cold. But then there's a split next week. Will it turn milder or will it stay colder? It's a classic butterfly effect. So that's the exactly. chaos theory. You might have heard of the butterfly effect. Butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, and you get a hurricane <laughs> in the states. And something happens in the early part of the forecast that then suddenly makes a big difference later on. Fascinating, absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Now that was the temperature at 5,000 feet. This is Hull, because uh, we've got a Hull man the here. Of course, of the yeah. yeah. And it's, it's the somewhere in the middle be. of the UK. It gives an idea of the temperature that we experience at the surface, doesn't so it? So this we call a meteogram, and, and what you're looking at is the size of each of these blue and red uh, bars, if you like. Uh, the smaller they are, the more certain we can be. Um, and it's giving us daytime and nighttime temperatures. Uh, we've got an average here with the, the solid lines. Um, but you can see that the bars are much, much bigger the further ahead in time we go. Again, you would expect that. But these are particularly large bars. And, and it gives us a huge range of temperatures from down at minus 10 Celsius at night here on Monday to plus That's 16. A week on Monday. That's, that's, that's the early part of December. Yes. Yes. It's a week December. Third of December. Uh, we'll be opening your advent calendars we will in be. Hull, yep. and it could be minus 10, minus 11, or it, it could, could be, be plus 16. Plus, as, a, as a minimum. So that's th th just an example of the spread. It's yep. not likely to be one of those two extremes, but we, at the moment, it's just too early to say. It could be somewhere anywhere on that on that barb. Yep. So it just goes to show the uncertainty within that. But if we have a look at the same sort of plot from this time last week, uh, which is this one here. So this is what we were just looking at. This is from this time last week. And you can see that even at the same duration. Yeah, same look ahead. They're it's much, much smaller. Much smaller the red bars. in particular, uh, they were all below average up until the end of this week when we were looking at it last week, exactly. which gave us confidence. Uh, the, we, we were more certain, we were less uncertain, it gave exactly, us that confidence yeah. that yeah. it was going to turn colder and stay cold. Whereas comparing this week's forecast with the red line, just as many are above average as below average for the end of next week. Yeah. And so we couldn't, at this point, post this, for example, that we confidently <laughs> posted we did last week, last week yeah. talking about how the temperatures were going to drop during the week So ahead. there's always some uncertainty, but sometimes there's more uncertainty than it others. Really this is one of those situations, on because you've got that split, one or the other, it, yeah. it's very uncertain. Whereas last week, we were pretty confident that this week it was going to get colder, and we'd see pretty much what we have done. So yeah. it just goes to show it's always different. The weather is always different. Even the day-to-day -day is different. But the, the projection looking forward and, and the level of confidence that Forecaster talks about because of that uncertainty is always changing as well. It's, and it's, it's why Ensemble Forecast is so important yeah. because when we were looking last week at this week pretty much all of those 50 solutions were telling us about the same thing we knew it was going to be cold fantastic brilliant really fascinating stuff Helen thank you very much You're for very coming welcome. on we'll have much more of this in the 10-day trend to, um, tomorrow we will record that uh, this time tomorrow that'll be on YouTube and on Facebook so that's the kind of thing we go into on the 10-day trend and when we often say on the 10-day trend you know we give different scenarios and people always say oh you just don't know and it's like yeah we we just don't know but we're these no are one the things no these one are knows the th exactly we're not keeping secrets from you no one around the world everyone in the United States everyone across Europe everyone all the all the weather modelers in Japan are always having these uncertainties. No one knows for certain what the weather's doing uh, beyond the certain. What we could time. do if we lacked integrity is we could say it's definitely going to be cold next yeah. week and we'd have 50% chance of being right and then we could boast about the fact that we got it right <laughs> and no one else got it right. But we're being honest and we're saying there's an equal likelihood. It's the science of meteorology and that's what we'll discuss more again on programs like this and, and through the 10-day trend. So uh, yes, thank you very much, Helen. That was You're absolutely welcome. fascinating. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank any, you. any more questions coming in? Uh, Twitter comment from uh, Trip, Tripodosaurus. Nice to see the excitement gained from looking at data. <laughs> 
I, I hope you, that's, yeah, that's you. I don't think that's they're being you. sarcastic. No, I don't I think they are. No, I'm sure they're not. You've got that postage stamp. That's your wallpaper, isn't it? That's mm. in your in your house. Mm. I'm sure. Um, lots. Any signs of an SSW sudden stratospheric warming? Well, that's what led. A uh, sudden stratospheric warming, the stratosphere suddenly warms up and leads to the polar vortex, and that can then lead to an east. That's what happened earlier this year with the beast from the east. It's too early for that kind of thing to be happening, really, so no signs of that at the moment. But obviously, we'll be keeping you updated. There's lots of people, if you follow them on Twitter, who, who keep a very close eye on that uh, kind of thing. Uh, any other questions coming in? Um... Three Celsius with precipitation, could it become wintry? Well, that's the thing about snow, isn't it? It's a, there's a margin, and that's one of the things why it's the hardest thing to forecast, because that subtle difference, it can be plus two and snowing. It can be even warmer. It depends also on the stability of the atmosphere. It depends on the temperature above you. Sometimes you get a rapid temperature drop as you go high in the sky. That's unstable air, and it could be plus six and start snowing, if that's the case. Or it could be one degree and rain right, if you yeah. have what's called temperature inversion, for example, you've got milder air above you. So Super surface cool temperatures, water, yeah. the temperature on your thermometer at the ground level isn't always the best indicator in terms of whether it will snow or not. We, one of the most reliable things is what we call the wet bulb freezing level. So the height at which the air is freezing, that will give us an idea. Typically, you get snow around 200 metres below the wet bulb freezing level. Sometimes if it's particularly heavy precipitation, it will be... Uh, 400 metres below that uh, freezing level. So, um, Another good question from Chris O'Shea. Uh, there's talk of El Nino, but balanced now. Uh, it's been neutral, El Nino. Is it El Nino or La Nina? It's been neutral recently. There are signs of a, an El Nino developing. It's on the way, but it looks at the moment like it'd be quite a weak El Nino. And the effects of El Nino on the UK weather are, well, at best vague. El Nino at this time of year can actually lead to slightly wetter um, spells through the latter half of the year. But an El Nino at the early part of the year, January and particularly February, can then lead to colder conditions across the UK. So it's definitely an area that we're looking at. We'll be it's keeping one of many it's things that influence One of that many influences. drivers around yes, the world. Yes, something and El, will definitely. I said the link between El Nino and the UK weather is is particularly weak, but it's definitely something we'll be keeping. We an have eye. a good explainer on El Nino. We do. Don't we? Oh, um, oh, the, um, we do. Met Office that's Learn a, about that's a good what, link. Actually, it's not the Learn About Weather channel, but if you search for Met Office YouTube. Uh, El Nino, we've gone over a million over views, a million on, views that on that video. So uh, look for that on YouTube. And do go to our sister channel, Learn About Weather, and you can see all kinds of exciting uh, videos. This is the one that we released last week about um, uh, a raindrop. And what's the difference between a raindrop and a drizzle Watch drop? This. Um, this. Oh. Raindrop falls out of the sky, and at first it's a perfect sphere due to something known as cohesion. And then you get uh, the, the, the um, air resistance acting on the bottom, and it starts to flatten out on the Don't bottom. Don't spoil it for them. Go and look at it on YouTube. Go and sign up to our that's, sister that's, station. That's not the only thing that happens <laughs> in this video. <laughs> not, <laughs> I'm not giving the whole thing away. Are you sure? Uh, but you can subscribe Wait to our YouTube next. channel. You won't we'll believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Do subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's one of the many um, social medias that we use. YouTube, obviously, Facebook. And or maybe not, Twitter, uh, Instagram, we're also on Snapchat as well. And I just wanted to say other things that we're looking at this week. Weather Ready, a big campaign launching uh, tomorrow about being prepared uh, for all kinds of weather. So keep your eyes out for that, hashtag Weather Ready. And also, before we go, I just wanted a big thank you to the rest of the team, because we've been doing this for about six months. A uh, big thank you to Mark Machin, who made that video about uh, rain and drizzle. And uh, we've been doing this for about six months now. Thank you for watching. Thank you for sending in all your questions but we can only do it with the support of the other people involved uh, around the other side of the curtain here so there's a guy called Steve Fallon who looks after the, um, the whole studio here the Simon Hammett and uh, uh, Jonathan Hunter as well who looks after YouTube they're not all working it all the time but basically those guys basically put us on air so without them we wouldn't be able to do this as I say we've been doing it for about six months but uh, we want to keep going so keep sending your questions in give us a thumbs up uh, share it with your friends and uh, yeah thank you thank you very much for watching See you next week.